value, value is an interesting idea, what something is valued, the way we value things. I was asking my four-year-old son, what's the most valuable thing you have, Jude? What's the most valuable thing? And he said his spidey watch, <laughs> which cost us less than $10, does not in fact tell time. <laughs> and its only function, as best I can tell, is an alarm that goes off at random intervals for a minute long each. We can't figure out how it got set, how to unset it, and it makes this really beautiful <laughs> sound for a minute randomly throughout the day. It's his most valuable thing. Um, value, value. I was on eBay yesterday, and did you know there, there, is a, there is a small town in Texas for sale? You buy a town for three and a half million dollars. I would say, way too low. Something's wrong with that town. Be careful. You're probably buying a ghost town. And by that, I mean haunted with ghosts. Don't buy that town. Towns should cost more than three and a half million dollars. That's my only point. I don't know what's happening but it's, I'm not the purchaser, I do know that. Value, value, the way we value things. Value is at the heart of what Paul is, is writing to the churches in Galatia. In this sixth chapter letter, uh, Paul's addressing communities throughout this region of the world that he greatly valued. Um, Paul was a, a missional apostle. He, he spent very little time once he was sent by God into uh, his surrounding world. He spent very little time returning home. He loved being out and with the people that he felt called to. He had great value for the Gentile people, the non-Jewish people, the people outside of his own family of faith tradition. Um, and, and he's writing this letter to the Galatians because in, there's this sort of key core question at the heart of it the strife that they're facing as a community, but honestly, strife that he could feel was being felt by the larger church, the larger Christian movement in that Mediterranean area. And the question was, who is of value in the kingdom or the kingdom of God? Who is of value? Who do we value in this community? For the next month, we're going to be asking questions about community, questions that emerge as we gather together as people, questions at the heart of what it means to be community together. And for the next three weeks, I'll be walking us through the letter to the Galatians, because this is a letter that deals with the subject of community. And today, we're going to talk about the question of how we value people in the kingdom of God. As I said, uh, Galatia was not like a city or a town. It was a whole region. Imagine Paul's letter to the Texans, right? That's how we read the letter to the Galatians. It's multiple Christian communities throughout a larger regional area. Paul spent a good amount of time in the region of Galatia. Interestingly, he was there just before he did return home to be at something called the Council of Jerusalem. This afternoon, our regional area is going to have something called annual conference where uh, people like me will get together and discuss the business of the church and perhaps uh, take up new ideas and, and new ventures in the year to come. And the Council of Jerusalem was something like that. It was a gathering of the early Christian movement leaders, and they were specifically talking about uh, the question of value and, and who gets to determine how people live in this Christian community. A key question for them was whether or not new Christians who were coming from beyond the Jewish tradition would have to live according to the Jewish traditions, the Mosaic law, the laws of Moses, things like keeping the Sabbath, things like dietary restrictions, things like circumcision, you know, like, are, is this going to be something that we ask people to take on as they come into this movement? So, Paul's spending his time in Galatia uh, just before he's about to go to Jerusalem to have this very important confrontation. And, and he's writing this letter in response back to the people in Galatia because he can hear uh, through the grapevine that after he leaves, there are these other voices that come in and be, begin preaching a different kind of gospel, a, a gospel that wasn't built on the grace of Jesus, the gospel that, that Paul proclaims, but rather a, a gospel that invites people back into the rules and regulations and restrictions that Paul had himself been and was attempting to liberate others from. So with that in mind, we're going to begin in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. If you want to follow along in a Bible with you or on your phone, Galatians 1, verse 10. Paul says this, Am I trying to win over human beings or God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I wouldn't be Christ's servant. 
brothers and sisters, I, I want you to know that the gospel I preached isn't human in origin. I didn't receive it or learn it from a human. It came through revelation from Jesus Christ. You heard about my previous life in Judaism, how severely I harassed God's church and tried to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my peers because I was much more militant about the traditions of my ancestors. But God had set me apart from birth and called me through his grace. God was pleased to reveal God's son to me so that I might preach about him to the Gentiles. I didn't immediately consult with any human being. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to see the men who were apostles before me either, but I went away into Arabia, and I returned again to Damascus. And then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, and I stayed with him for 15 days, but I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the brother of the Lord. And, and then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I wasn't known personally by the Christian leaders or churches in Judea. They only heard a report about me. The man who used to harass us now preaches the faith that he once tried to destroy. So they were glorifying God because of me. We're going to pause there for now. And, and so Paul's taking on a couple of questions underneath that big question of who do we value in the kingdom or in the kingdom of God. Underneath that question is, okay, well, how are people asked to change if they're coming into the kingdom or kingdom of God. But then under that question is this deeper question you hear him beginning to wrestle with. Who is the norm in the kingdom of God? Or, put in Paul's words, who are we trying to impress? Who are we trying to impress? Whose standard are we living up to? Who are we serving? Because Paul knows what the prophet Bob Dylan wrote. You got to serve somebody, right? <laughs> you got to serve somebody. Paul had been uh, obsessed with serving and impressing the people above him in his community, whether that be within the religious institutions or the state institutions to which he belonged. He references this in this text. If you don't know, before Paul was Paul, he was named Saul. And he was this rising up-and-comer zealot within his Jew Jewish tradition. And he got the, his notoriety because he was so dogged and violent in oppressing the early Christian movement. That's how the early Christians knew of Saul, who became Paul. And, and he understood that the reason he got lured into that lifestyle was that he was not trying to serve God because God does not ask us to be violent with our neighbors. God does not ask us to snuff out religious movements through violence and oppression. Instead, what he realizes, oh, I'm trying to serve the people and the hierarchies and the structures and the authorities that are above me so I can keep climbing the ladder and get a nice pat on the head and a pat on the shoulder and the old attaboy and to keep after my job. That's what I was doing. I was so obsessed with trying to impress these authorities, and I was forgetting about the impact I had on people that I thought were beneath me. And so he knows the dark ends of trying to impress the authorities or the structures or the hierarchies to which we belong. He understands something about them, that they are full of people and no matter how well-intended a structure may be, no matter how wonderful we may imagine a hierarchy could be, it's still chock full of people, and people are corruptible. And if we make our lives about serving those things and not about serving God, then we ourselves could find, we could find ourselves, there we go, let my brain catch up to what my mouth is saying, we could find ourselves corrupted by the very thing that we think we're serving to make the world a better place. Paul uses this master and servant language because in his context, that makes sense. Everything was hierarchical. Everybody lives in service to somebody else. It goes all the way up to the top, except literally the two people who in theory aren't serving anyone, but God above them is Caesar and the high priest, right? Everyone else is falling into line somewhere underneath in that pyramid. You got Caesar, who's supposed to be God's representative in the state authority, and you got the high priest, who supposedly is God's conduit in the religious authority. And then Paul does something really subversive here. He reframes that structure and says, what if we all just report to God? What if we flatten the org chart? And what if rather than working through all these chains of command, what, what if we just serve God? Maybe that's what God intended in the first place was to have a personal relationship with each and every one of us because God's actually a fantastic middle manager, right? Turns out God can manage all of those direct reports. What if we didn't have to go through someone else to have access to God? What if we didn't have to commit our entire lives to serving a structure when we could instead try to listen to the rhythms of God's heart within our own? 
And so he says when, when he begins living into this relationship with God and, and he feels called by God to go serve the world, guess what he doesn't do, he says? He doesn't check with anybody. He doesn't get approval. He doesn't get it signed off. He doesn't go to annual conference or the Council of Jerusalem. He doesn't get his, his forms filled out. He doesn't get a notarized whatever. He just goes and does it. And he checks in about once every 15 years, you know, something reasonable, right? But he's just, he's focused on following God wherever God is going to lead him. And then he points out and says, have you noticed how good that has actually worked out for me before when I was committed to, to doggedly serving whatever structure I could to keep climbing whatever ladder was in front of me? I killed people and I was killing my soul in the process. And when I allowed myself to be freed up to have this living relationship with the living God who loves me, it turns out that works pretty well. Suddenly, these communities are flourishing all around his world. And then he points out, guys, that same oppressive structure that I lived my life in service to, that I ran from, that God called me out of, that gospel that saved my life and I want it to save your life, that's being undone because there are others who are trying to call you back into that oppressive system. They're saying, well, if you, you know, if you really want to love God, then you've got to live according to these rules. You've got to come back into this structure that we say is good for you. And Paul says, why would we go back to the old way? Why would we go back? We know where that runs. It's not good for you. It wasn't good for me. It's not going to be good for us. Friends, hear this. The kingdom of God does not operate according to our standards. The kingdom of God is going to shake us up. It's going to tear some structures down. It's going to build some new structures in their place. God's economy doesn't work the way that our economy does. God's structures don't work the way that our structures do. God is not looking to us to make sure that God gets the proper forms notarized in order to do good work in the world. God's kingdom is going to come in, bust in, and break up the things that we're really comfortable with that aren't working for everyone. And that's good news. It's good news when God begins to establish a personal relationship with each person rather than us working through a high priest and the Caesar. Turns out that works out pretty well. So why would we go back to a structure with a high priest and a Caesar if they're no longer the norms but God is instead? It turns out that all of us have equal access to the same God who knows us and loves us and planted God's image within each of our souls. That's good news. That's good news. I'm glad you see it too. So Paul continues in chapter 2. He says, then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem again. I love that. After 14 years, I checked in. This time he goes with Barnabas, and he took Titus along also. These names are important. He says, I went there because of a revelation, a.k.a. God told me to, right? Bishop didn't call me in. I went because God told me to. And I laid out the gospel that I preached to the Gentiles for them. So he goes and he tells them the story he's sharing with the non-Jewish people. But I did it privately with the influential leaders to make sure that I wouldn't be working or that I hadn't worked for nothing. However, not even Titus, who was with me and who was a Greek. So Titus is not a part of the Jewish community. This is important because in these days, the Christian community was a Jewish community. Not even Titus was required to be circumcised, he says. But false brothers and sisters who were brought in secretly slipped in to spy on our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We didn't give in. We didn't submit to them for a single moment so that the truth of the gospel would continue to be with you. The influential leaders didn't add anything to what I was preaching. Whatever they were makes no difference to me because God doesn't show favoritism. I love Paul's asides. But on the contrary, they saw that I had been given the responsibility to preach the gospel to the people who are not circumcised. That's his language for non-Jewish people. Just as Peter had been called to share the gospel with the circumcised. The one who empowered Peter to become an apostle to the circumcised empowered me also to be one to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, who's Peter, and John, who are considered to be key leaders, shook hands with me and Barnabas as equals when they recognized the grace that was given to me. So it was agreed that we would go to the Gentiles while they continued to go to the people who were circumcised. They asked only that we would remember the poor, which was certainly something I was willing to do. So let's pause here and notice a couple things. First, notice that Paul assumes the posture of an ally and advocate. 
So what I mean by that is Paul is a member of this Jewish community, but he goes there and he's present with Barnabas and importantly Titus, who is not a part of this community. And with Paul in spirit is this whole world of Gentiles that he has come to profess his faith in, essentially, his, his witnessing of God's spirit at work in. So he is an ally and an advocate for these Gentile persons who are currently beyond the scope of this early Christian movement. He speaks out not just of a theory, but a wealth of experience of his own relationship building that he has done for decades in these communities. And he brings Titus with him. This is important. When we're doing advocacy work, having someone who is actually directly impacted by said work and not simply taking up all the airspace as a well-meaning ally, that is important. Don't miss that. Paul brings Titus to the table and says, would you all listen to him for a second and tell me the Spirit of God not at work in this person? And they leave as friends shaking hands. Now, I love this part too. Oh, we need to hear this today. He is clear about who deserves his conversation and communication. He's clear about who deserves to be at the table with him, who deserves that kind of relationship with him. I need all of us to hear this. He says the influential leaders need this kind of courageous conversation. When he sits down at the table with these leaders, they are not where he is. I know last week we talked about Peter and his vision of the sheet. That all, all of Peter's sort of understanding, that happens after Paul talks to him. All right, let's look at the history of this. Peter and James and John, they're not with it yet. They don't quite understand what Paul is talking about, but they're at the table. And so Paul is willing to risk a courageous conversation. He invites his friends with him, knowing this could go one of two ways. Now, Paul makes up his mind that they can either get on board or we're just going to get on with God, right? This is their invitation to join what God is doing, but he he takes that seriously. Notice that he does not sit down and have a good faith conversation with bad faith actors. He does say that there are others, right? Did you hear him mention them? There are others who came in secret. Where do they say that? Ooh, who were brought, false brothers and sisters who were brought in secretly, slipped in to spy on our freedom and to make us slaves. Paul is not about to engage with people that he knows, like he used to be, are there for two purposes, disrupt and destroy. Why would you sit down at the table with someone whose only goal is to disrupt and destroy you and the people that you love? Friends, okay, we're going off script for a second. Start a pride month, Right? We got an election coming up in November. Have y'all heard about that? Are y'all aware? If you are looking for a reason to not engage with bad faith actors in your life who exist to disrupt or destroy you and your loved ones, here it is in the Bible, right? Paul is saying, do not waste your time on these fools because what you're doing is you're just inviting destruction into your own life. You're not going to have a fruitful conversation there. Because that's not a good faith conversation. Now, I am not saying to retreat into echo chambers. I am not saying that this is an excuse to give up on communication and conversation. Paul risks a really brave conversation with leaders who could have severe impact in his life and the the lives of the people that he loves. But he knows they are at the table in good faith to have a real spirited conversation and relationship. That is what we ought to commit our lives to not wasting our time on the trolls. Somebody please say amen. Amen. Okay, it's biblical. I wouldn't say it if it wasn't biblical, right? I love the way it ends too. They ask that we only remember the poor. They ask that we remember the poor. And Paul slips in that little line about, which of course I'd be happy to do, right? Thank you for that word, James, John, and Peter. Thank you, thank you. But I, I love that line because what I see is at the end of this conversation, and it must have gotten heated, right? These were people that were not on the same side at the start of this moment, but at the end, they leave shaking hands as brothers with a common cause. The, what I see here is the early Christian movement maintaining their energy and attention on the right things, They decide that it is more important to remain focused on the mission of God, in Paul's words, good news to the poor, rather than wasting time trying to force people into forced compliance with what is ultimately cultural and contextual living, right? The things that we are arguing over today in the life of the church 2024, my friends, it is so similar to the life of the church in the year 40 or 50 or 60 right? Ultimately, what we're talking about is people that get in deep, deep debates over what amounts to faithful, cultural, contextual living, 
And Paul and the leaders at the table realize, you know what? We were put on this earth, yes, to have hard conversations, but outside this table, you know who's not here is the poor waiting outside wondering when we are going to get our act together and begin to open up the storehouses of God to allow the hungry to eat and the thirsty to have water and the naked to be clothed. And they're wondering when this conversation is finally going to come to an end. That is why we are here. Let's keep our eyes on the goal. So here's it put a more simple way. It's more important that we commit ourselves to the same common goals than to live the same way. It is not my job on this earth to force you to live the way that I do, right? And it's not your job to force me to live the way that you do. It is our job to force this earth into being a hospitable, a habitable, and an equitable place for all of God's children. That is our job on this earth. Let's not forget what our job is, Yeah? And so Paul concludes the second chapter by saying, we ourselves believed in Christ Jesus so that we could be made righteous by the faithfulness of Christ and not by the works of the law. He's saying, we have Jesus. Jesus is trying to get us out of this old mode, this old mindset that we're gonna get more righteous and more good by doing all the good and making God love us more because we're just so, 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 so good at doing good. That's not the point, he says. He goes on to say this, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in my body, I live by faith. Indeed, by the faithfulness of God's Son who loved me and gave himself for me. Keep in mind who is writing these words. This is a man who, when Christ was crucified and risen, was still making it his life's mission to murder Christians. He's saying that that Christ died for me on that day before I had become Paul, back when I was Saul, before I had my stuff figured out, before I'd gone to God asking for forgiveness, before I'd had my revelationary uh, experience with God on the road, before I had any of this awareness of God's love and grace in my life, in that moment Christ still died for me. Why is that important? When we talk about who is of value, the answer is you are and I am and we are as we are, not as we hope to be, not as who God is turning us into, not as the refined, perfected in love vision of who we could be, but as we are in this moment. Christ did not die so that one day we could be deemed worthy. Christ died because God says we are worthy. Present tense, in the moment now. Our response to God's grace and love is faith. Not a precursor, not a prerequisite. I don't care what gospel you've heard before. Hear now the gospel according to Paul, the gospel of Christ. That our faithfulness, as Paul says, is an outpouring, a stepping forward out of the grace and the love of God that God pours out upon us. That is free of charge. That is not predicated on anything you have done, are doing, or will do. It's already there. Faith is the response. To die to self is not to deny who we are, but rather, it's, it's a few things. It's to embrace a relationship with the living God. It's to claim our identity here and now as worthy and beloved. And it's to live into that faith of Christ who will not ask us to change everything about the core of who we understand ourselves to be, but will ask us in the midst of our faith to look up and look out and please do not look past the poor. This is the first message that Paul has for the people of Galatia. It's the message we take to heart as we begin this month as well.